And welcome to Alouette's Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouette's football, presented by Sport Buff. I'm your host, Tim Kapper, along with Cliffy D. Happy holidays, buddy. Yes, indeed. Tis the season, and tis the off-season as well. So it's, <laughs> It is, like, it is. Like, we, we go from the off-season of the Canadian Football League into the holiday season of, you know, the world, and pretty soon we'll be back to talking CFL football again, but, you know. Now we're just going to enjoy the holidays. <laughs> exactly. Um, it is the we were hoping for a guest that didn't pan out, uh, unfortunately. But uh, you know we'll be hard at work to get some talk to some people during the off season. Obviously for our off season shows, and uh, this is our season finale for our sixth season. It was a very big sixth season to start off. First and foremost, Cliff. Oh yeah. Um, I happened to see a story today talking about. Um, you know, the, the best and worst logos for 2021. And I'm sorry, I'm going to, I know we did it at the beginning of the season. We're going to end it off by tooting our own horn again, but it started off this year by us rebranding. Um, and with a very successful rebrand and I, I am, uh, I'm glad we're, you know, how the six season started and then where, it, where it ended off today. Yeah. And we actually started the season still not entirely sure if we were going to get a 2021 CFL season. I mean, they, they did. Yes, they came out with a schedule, but things were still so much up in the air. There was so much up in the air still regarding whether or not a season was actually going to happen this year. And lo and behold, it did. A shortened season. Only 14 games were, was played this year by the Canadian Football League's nine teams. But we still got a season. We still got Grey Cup playoffs. We still got an actual Grey Cup in Hamilton. And yeah, I, I, I think... When you, when you think about whether or not this season, whether it was a success or not for for your your team, depends on your team, depends on what you consider to be successful. But I think the just over when you talk about the overall picture, the fact that the Canadian Football League was able to put on a season shortened as it was, and only had to reschedule a couple of games as, as a result of COVID nineteen. Yeah, tech, tech, technically one. That's it. Te- well, yeah, technically one was it, but there's some uh, start times got that got changed a little bit. So, I mean, it wasn't 100%, but yeah, I mean, really, truly, only one game was truly affected as a result of uh, as a result of COVID-19. So, I mean, that's that's a tremendous accomplishment. Like that, you got to give props to the Canadian Football League and its nine teams, the board of governors, the players, and yes, even you, the fans, everybody played a role in this. So, you know, I, I, I got to give props to everybody for doing everything they could to make sure that this shortened CFL season ended up being a relatively successful one. I think so. Yeah. And obviously we're, we're looking forward to 2022 and we, you know, again, we got our yearly Christmas gift, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. That was fun to fun to get. And, and it was pretty funny how you and I were going back and forth last week on how we, you know, whether we wanted to do the, the show last week and, I think we thought about it, sat down, thought about it, and it's like, we, I think we made the right decision considering we now have a whole bunch of news to talk about. But obviously, before we get to that, we want to talk about how our thoughts are were on this 2021 season, as you just mentioned, and what we're talking about, especially for the Alouettes. I think at the beginning of the season, both you and I thought that the Alouettes would be in the hunt for the for the CFL Eastern Division. I think we expected to be, I expected them to be a little bit closer. I think I predicted them to be second. Um Al's ended up being a game out of second, you know, finishing the season at seven and seven. Um, but all in all, considering, you know, stats wise, the Owls did absolutely amazing considering where they were ranked. Uh, seven and seven was, to me was just okay. Um, obviously, everybody wants their team to win every single game. Um, but, you know, I, there were still some issues, obviously, with the Alouettes. Obviously, this year it had to be the. Um, yeah, the inconsistencies at uh, when it came to special teams and obviously what happened with injuries. Injuries were a huge part, a huge part of the Alouette's timeline this year. And uh, I think it to me that that's why they ended up being at seven and seven. Oh, without question. And there was, by my count, there was at least four games that had a couple things just bounce the Alouette's way. Those losses would have turned into wins. So, I mean, like we could have been talking about technically a a team with 11 wins, which would have been absolutely dominant in the CFL East this year. And it just didn't materialize. I mean, you can blame it on injuries. You can blame it on uh, penalties. I think that was another big thing, too, is oh, God, this yes. team's <laughs> discipline was sorely lacking. Yes, I agree. 
like there was a lot of backbreaking penalties, like just dumb stuff, like dumb stuff that would just happen at the worst possible time. And the, when the opponent's able to capitalize on that, and you got no one to blame but yourself. Like you, you can talk about how you know the refs are this and that and the other, and, but you know at the end of the day, you got to take care of your own business. And there's a lot of times where there's just dumb penalties, like just really, really dumb penalties. And you're like, why? Why would you do that? And yeah. But that's part of football. That's part of, you know, learning and growing and, you know, being prepared. I mean, and again, who do you blame for that? I mean, the players have to take some blame, obviously. Coaches, they got to they gotta share some of the blame as well. Which I mean, some did, which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, it's... It's never easy. There, there's no question about that, especially to with this being a shortened season and so many changes had to come about as far as you know, how practice was run and just how much time was able to be devoted by the players to all sorts of things like, you know, whether, the, you know, protocols and rules and just, you know, their overall play. I mean, it it, it wasn't easy for sure. I mean, at, at the end of the day, they, they managed to get it in. They managed to. Somehow make it work. It's just you, you look at the penalties though, and you're like, "This is this is so dumb. This is so dumb." Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, even even us here, you know, at the flight deck, we we had to deal with it too when it came to what we're normally used to when it comes to speaking with players and having access. And then you know, all media went through that this year. Um, but yeah, there was a huge paradigm shift when it came to the accessibility, and that was one of the things that the CFL has prided themselves on over the years is accessibility for the fans with their team and with us in the media it's it, it was definitely different because now pretty much every all their views and you know, uh, scrimmages and, or not scrimmages but scrums are done pretty much virtually via zoom and yeah you can definitely get some information on the, uh, you know that way but you're still not getting that same experience and fans too were not getting that same experience as well like that you you can't you know, talk to the players afterwards, or it's very limited as to what you can do. Like well, the interaction you can have with the players post game was limited at best. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you become so accustomed to having that accessibility and then through no fault of your own and through no fault of the team either, it's not there anymore. And it's, it, it certainly made for a very challenging way to present things because yeah, we would have loved to have had more players on to talk about things uh, and, it just didn't pan out. It, it's unfortunate. It was certainly not for lack of trying. It was just the circumstances that were given to us this season. It's it's unfortunate. I'm, I'm hoping that this is just a one-off. Like, this year is sort of like, okay, it's because of this. It's because of COVID. It's because of any number of things that we have to do things this way. God willing, 2022 will be, I don't want to say necessarily 100% back to normal, but here's hoping that at least we can get back a little bit closer to the way things used to be in that regards. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and and we're looking at some of the players too. I mean, can you imagine what it'd been like if Gino hadn't been hurt for the couple of games that he was? He he probably would have led the CFL in receiving yards. Can you imagine the yardage that William Stambeck would have had if he had played a full season? Oh I mean, my god! I mean, I can only imagine. I think what was he said he was on pace for? I think they said it was eighteen hundred yards. I think that's yeah. what they said. Yeah, and that's in fourteen games. Fourteen games. It's incredible, and he even missed a couple of games. But imagine if it was a full eighteen game season. My God, we oh he he like, may it's funny and I yes they can say you know what you know what he would have been projected as but if that's the case he could easily have surpassed Mike Pringle as the second player in league history with over two thousand yards in a single season. I have no doubt in my mind just the way that he played like he was practically unstoppable this season. Yep. The only thing it's, that the only thing that took him down, I think, was a was a hammy. Was it a hamstring? It was an ankle. An ankle and food poisoning. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that but despite all of that, not only did he manage to lead the league in rushing, but he was actually the Eastern nominee for most outstanding player. Like that that's incredible. Like, yeah. like it just speaks to the work that he's put in, the fact, the 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 want and desire to prove himself. Because again, he came into the 2019 season, barely anyone outside of Montreal knew who this guy was, and he just blew the doors off of everybody. Like he put in a solid performance. He was able to go to the NFL and try his luck there. It didn't quite pan out. Was able to come back here to Montreal, and you could tell it, it really lit a fire under him. Like I, I think he was beyond motivated to show that hey, I can be a superstar in this league. And yeah. sure enough, the proof's right there. I guarantee everybody in the Canadian Football League knows who the hell William Stanback is now. Yeah. And, and then there was, you know, VA, big play VA. He comes in, 
after having a great 2019 season and what everybody's saying is a, a quote unquote so- will he be able to get over his quote unquote sophomore slump as a starter it went okay for VA for most of the season um you know there were are as you and I will, will both say there are, I think there were some things that he still needed to work on uh, we understand he wants to be a leader this guy he is a leader that's one thing we can say without a shadow of a doubt um, mm-hmm. But I think what he needs to do is to not necessarily take everything on his shoulders. Um, use the people that are around him. Um, and he's, he still does need to improve. I, and it's just shown, I think, that he is our quarterback by the signing, which I know it's a yay spoiler alert. But, <laughs> you know, just by the signing itself and what happened after that, that he is our he is our court going to be our starting quarterback going forward. So, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, VA gets hurt. Uh, yes, it was a non-throwing arm, but still, um, he still wanted to play. He was there every day, every game, pumping up his uh, up his teammates. And you know, third year's the charm. Hey, it's very possible. You know, it's better to say than a sophomore slump. I mean, what? It, even though technically it wasn't, <laughs> but you know, hey, third to third year's the charm for for VA. Uh, I, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Why he, he can't be he can't be better in twenty twenty two. And let's not forget, he's still young. He's still young by quarterback terms. Yeah. I mean, you know, like a lot of people are saying, well, he's not in that upper echelon. Like, no, he's not. But you know what? He's getting there. And he still has time. Like, no, you cannot compare him right now to the to a Bo Levi Mitchell. Although, mind you, his I, I think the roses come off the, the the blooms come off the rose for him a little bit. And Michael Riley, I mean, yeah, his his status is is taking a hit as far as, you know, over the past couple of seasons, but he still is considered a premier quarterback in this league. And he's also got a different route than a lot of the others. Right. But uh, for me, I think with VA, like, yeah, this year, I, I, I really did feel there was two Vernon Adams that were playing each game yeah. at times, and you just didn't know which one was going to show up. Yeah. It, that, and I think, he real, I think he realizes that. I'm sure he must have seen it, especially, too, with being being knocked out for the, the rest of the season. I'm sure he's had a lot of time to reflect back on – the kind of quarterback he was in 2021 and he knows he's got to get better. He knows he's got to keep improving. He's got to keep working. Like he's, he's not there yet. Yeah. The Mr. Hyde, the Mr. Hyde version of VA needs to kind of, you know, needs, needs to, he needs to be excised, you know, <laughs> let's get a priest in there. Let's do what we need to do. Let's banish him. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I think, and I think maybe maybe in a, a small way, this injury was a blessing in disguise. Like maybe it really gave him a chance to reflect back and see what needed to be worked on. And I got a feeling like once he's got the one hundred percent okay to get back and train the way he we know he can train, I I'm really excited to see him be- come back here in in May for training camp because I fully expect to see a much more polished quarterback. I fully expect him to do the kind of work because that's the kind of guy he is. He's the kind of guy that knows he has to get better and i believe he's going to do everything possible to make sure that he does get better yeah no, i agree um poor bj cunningham yeah second oh. second time and was it is the second time in this is second time in two second in two time in two, se- in two seasons yeah where he's gone out with a, an injury you know this time it just happened to be a, f- a freak injury during practice and it's tough too because he you know he's a free agent this year but you know the wide receiving car i think was pretty good i mean hey you know BJ goes down, but the Alouettes fans get to see Reggie Smith Jr. Reggie White Jr. Sorry, Reggie White Jr. Yeah, and what what a find! Like, absolutely outstanding. Uh, like I said, a lot of people were expecting a guy like Dante Absher to come in and be the replacement, but Reggie White Jr. came in instead, and he's proven it. Like he's mm-hmm. he he had a great great chemistry with uh, with all the quarterbacks. Uh, like to, for 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 the Alouettes to find guys like this is incredible because you know what Jake Winnick can do. You know what Eugene yep. Lewis can do. You know what Quan Bray can do. Uh, you know what BJ Cunningham can do, obviously. Yeah. But for someone like Reggie White Jr., who is a relative newcomer, for him to come up here and to step into that role almost seamlessly, and he, he put up some pretty solid numbers. And I'm really excited to see what he can do in 2022 as well. Now that he's pretty much a part of things, you know, like he understands the offense. He understands what needs to be done. Uh, he didn't really get a chance to work too, too much with Vernon. I'd be really curious to see how those two connect because I think, uh, given the opportunity, those guys can really make some magic happen as well. For sure. Um, O line and O line and D line. O line suffered drastically this year because of of injuries. 
Um, but even so, the Alouettes offense still rated, you know, they were still up there in the upper echelons of the, uh, the CFL uh, uh, stats books from for all of the for you know for the entire season. Um, mm-hmm. You know, obviously the record just didn't record didn't really show that. But uh, you know, injuries are a part of it, and on, on, we're just hoping that 2022 can be a year where uh, the turn, turnover on on the O line uh, isn't as bad as it was this year. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that they have to do is they, they've got some good young pieces that needed needed a chance to develop and grow and i think for the most part a couple of them have like a guy like sean jameson who was this was his first year playing center for the alouettes and until he got injured he was doing a phenomenal job i i was really impressed with uh, how he was able to come together uh philip gagnon who was kind of iffy when he first started in montreal ended up going to ottawa for a little bit and then came back here he has really flourished, but once again, once the injury bug bit him, he was out of the lineup, and that uh, that left a bit of a hole that was proven to be very difficult to fill as well. I mean, it's it, it's this is what's the tough part is like you want the depth, but at the same time, you gotta let pl- you gotta let players play, you gotta let the rookies come in and get their feet wet a little bit too. It's just it's tough, especially when you're in the midst of a playoff run and you're kind of learning on the job, like. I know trial by fire sometimes is, is the way to go, but I didn't think it quite worked out as well as what they hoped. I mean, it felt like at times the Alouettes were just plugging holes on that offensive line and just hoping that everything would just hold together. And as we saw, it, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I'd be really curious to see, like especially going into free agency next year, would the Alouettes be considering to bring in like uh, one or two guys that are like young veterans? Because let's face it, there's there's a lot of free agents that are going to be made available. It's going to be interesting. And I think uh, when it, when you take a look at the offensive line, hey, the Owls cleared yep. up two hundred thousand dollars off the cap. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And again, to their credit, they did shore up uh, guys like uh, like Jameson, like uh, Christian Matt, uh, Philip Gagnon. Yeah, earlier in the season, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, just before the season ended, uh, yeah. they they signed those guys to extensions. So they realized that's their nucleus. That those are the guys that you have to build around. And they're as I said, these these are all fantastic guys, along with Tony Washington. Like, but okay, you got the, you got your starting lineup. Someone goes down the injury. Who who's going to step in? You need to have someone like a young veteran that can step in at almost at a moment's notice and can almost be like sort of a. A ja- like a Swiss Army knife that you know anyone could play any of those positions and ha- have them not miss a beat. To me, I th- I think that's one of the keys that uh, Danny Machos is going to have to take a look at when it comes to free agency is the offensive line and to bring in someone that has experience but is not long in the tooth. Because yeah. uh, t- to me, I I think that's you got to protect your quarterback regardless of who the quarterback is. Whether it's well, we know it's going to be Vernon Adams for sure. We're hoping Matthew Schiltz re-signs with the Alouettes in free, when free agency hits or before free agency hits. But regardless of who the quarterback is for the Alouettes, you got to protect them. And yeah, you, you got the the nucleus signed, which is fantastic. You got them extended, but you got to build that depth. You got to make sure you have that, and not just you know the, the obvious thing to do would be a draft in the like in the Canadian Football League draft to go after offensive linemen, and that's great. But you still have to develop them. You still have to get them ready and. It's not just a matter of drafting big guys and plugging in holes. It, mm-hmm. That's what the Elowitz did this year, and the results were kind of like their record, 50-50. Yeah. It, it just didn't quite – I mean, it was, when it works, it's fine, but when it doesn't work, it shows. And this is something that, as far as I'm concerned, needs to be addressed. And make sure you have that depth. Make sure you have any number of players that can step in at a moment's notice and be ready to perform or be ready to protect the quarterback because the games truly are – won and lost in the trenches and having a solid offensive line for what will be 18 games next year is going to be crucial in order to make sure that Vernon Adams becomes the quarterback that he needs to for this team. Yeah. And, and obviously on defense, the defense, you know, was primarily unscathed this year, but I think there needs some need to be some slight tweaks on, on the defensive side of the, of the ball, because you know, there were at times, there were times where, where the out, which just got burned um, and, and they couldn't stop anybody. Mm-hmm. But as I said, it's. I, I think the defense had a year to grade. I think the defense had a better overall. I think had a, they had a better season than the offense. But I mean, it's. Um, yeah, I, I, there are there I aren't. I don't think there aren't as many questions for the Alouettes defense. Uh, I'm sure they could pick up some guys. It's gonna be interesting to see. There's just so many damn players on the free agency list right now. 
It, it's hard well, to go one, through. It's hard to go through. Well, I, I think if anything, like one of the main concerns was how was this defensive line going to gel and come together for this team? And I think for the most part, they did a very good job. Like Almondo Sewell, Nick Usher, and David Menard. Wow. Yeah. Talk about great acquisitions by Danny Machocha. Those three guys, I think, became the heart and soul of this defensive line, and they played phenomenal football. Jamal Davis, who came out of nowhere and was able to replace Antonio Simmons on the defensive line. Unbelievable find. And my goodness, uh, Woody Barron still is playing at a very high level. Yeah. I mean, like th- These are guys that... Again, th- that was the big concern was how is this defensive line going to go? How are they going to be able to attack the opposing quarterback? And for the most part, they did a great job in disrupting the quarterback and making making them work for every yard they had they had to get against the Alouettes. To me, though, I think when you take a look at the secondary, yeah, there's some bright spots there for sure. There's some guys that definitely belong on this team. But yeah, there was a few times where some guys, like you said, they were burnt, like burnt bad. Yeah, and. and- and uh, obviously, as we met, you know, with injuries too, special teams was a huge issue. It needs to be shored up. We got a, a few signees at the end, during the end of the season, which probably could do it. Um, but you know, that will be a work in progress, obviously, especially with the changes with coaches and stuff like that, which we'll talk about too. But um, yeah, I, th- I think one of the things though is this team pretty much hung its hat on Mario Alford yeah. as a returner, yeah, which is great, and he the first game. First game in Edmonton. Yeah. He exploded. And you, you you immediately were brought back to 2019 towards the end of that season and how exciting it was to watch him do his thing. And you get excited, like, okay, this is great. This is all settled. No, no need to worry. We got Alfred. Everything's good. But then he goes down to injury, and trying to replace him was tough. Yeah, guys who really couldn't do it. Tough. The guys who couldn't do it. Uh, guys who were doing amazing and then got hurt. We had that a few times. Mm-hmm. Um but some guys, some and some guys just shouldn't be anywhere near. Well, they were again. They were. It was. They're trying to fit a, you know, uh, a square peg into a round hole. They're they just trying to fill the spots any way, any way they could, and it, it, you know, and as we saw, a coach, you know, coach really took the brunt of it. That's that's why, that's why there were some changes. Um, uh, well, the captain has to go down with the ship, and yeah. unfortunately, that's that's really what it is. You can't fire twenty some odd players on the on special teams. No, no. So no. how well? Uh, how, how would you speaking of the coaches, and this is this last thing for the team in twenty 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 one? How would you rate Kahari's sophomore season as a head coach? I mean, totally different season, weird season, obviously, considering everything that he did. And I mean, to me, the the rumors that came out of uh, that just popped up all of a sudden and caused a, a firestorm that shouldn't have been caused. Uh, asking questions, stuff in the in the you know stuff in the uh, in the media and stuff like that. You know, to me, considering what Kahari had, seven and seven, great season. Yes, we didn't go beyond that. I mean, yes, he's zero two in the playoffs in his career. That's okay. Uh, we understand that. Um, but considering what he did, what he was able to do, and, and what he had to do with, I, you know, I would still, I would give Kahari a C for the year if I were to give him a, a, a grade. But I mean, overall, I mean, you know, I, I, I still think that this is Kahari's team, and uh, Kahari is Kahari. Oh, absolutely, he is, and the players still believe in him. The players are still willing to run through a wall for this guy. To me, though, I think there was a lot of times though where the play calling was a bit scared, and. To me, I think that's, I don't know whether it's because of the roster he had before him, if it was just uncertainty of certain teams, I, I honestly can't say. But there were a lot of times where a lot of his calls just left me scratching my head. I'm like, I'm like okay, well, I, 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 I don't get it. Like, yeah, so, some of and, the third and short, uh, some of the third and short, some of the, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It wasn't it wasn't perfect by any stretch, and we didn't expect perfection out of Kahari. I mean, I think a lot has been made about the fact that yeah, twenty nineteen was such a phenomenal season in so many ways that everybody just expected twenty twenty one to be a carbon copy of that, and that wasn't going to happen. That was it's a different team. They, you still got a lot of the the core elements of that twenty nineteen team with this one, but there's still just enough to be different and. I think when I when I take a look at what Kahari's body of work and what he did in 2021, there was a lot of good. And I think once he had his pieces in place, everything worked. I think when he was given pieces that didn't work and he tried to adjust it, 
that's where things got tricky. That's where things kind of fell apart. Because again, I, I take a look at the, the the four games, the four game winning streak, where which ended up seeing the Alouettes in first place when it was all said and done in the Eastern Division. Mm-hmm. You can't tell me that that wasn't a well coached team. But when uh, towards the end, I'd say the last five games of the season, there was just a lot of misdirection, a lot of questionable decision making, and Kahari does have to. He's got to wear some of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you can you can say it's because he was given a quarterback that just didn't fit with the system, and I'm sorry to say he did not fit with the system. Uh, no matter what kind of insurance policy you think he was or should have been or whatnot, it was just not a good fit. Again, coach's job is to make it work. Kahari didn't make it work. Yeah, is that is that on him? In some degrees, yes. In some degrees, it's on the player. There's lots of other elements in play as well. So I mean, like there, you you almost have to give a pass, but at the same time, you can't help but wonder. If VA was healthy all year long, would it, it would have been a completely different story. There's no question in my mind it would have been. You could even say even if Matthew Schiltz was healthy, everything would you know things would would things have stayed the course. I believe it really would have. I, I really think when we saw Trevor Harris get acquired by the Alouettes, which I think also too may have had an effect on Matthew Schiltz as well, because like I said, there's a whole issue with his injury mm-hmm. and how long did it actually take him to recover from said injury? And would he have been able to go for the playoffs if needed? All speculative at this point. At the end of the day, this is what we ended up with. And it was not the same Alouette's team, despite people thinking, okay, well, Kari's in charge. Everything's going to be okay. Like, well, it wasn't okay. Is that on him? Is that on the players that he was given to work with? I'd say you'd have to, the, the blame's got to be shared equally in, in that regards. Right. It's a tough situation. It's, it's, not one you ha- as a coach you don't want to go have to think about these sort of things but sometimes it just happens sometimes you just you, this is a hand you're dealt and you got to play it and Kahari played it as best he could as far as I'm concerned I think he truly wanted and believed in this team to be able to be a winner but at the end of the day it just it didn't materialize I mean like there was a lot of regression for any number of reasons things just went south yeah. quickly and painfully to tell you the truth it was just it was not pretty the last month of football was not pretty to watch for montreal yeah uh, I, I i'm sorry to say it like it they backed into the playoffs essentially like if <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that you know the teams out west were just as bad if not worse i don't i don't think this this was not a playoff caliber football team they were very lucky to make the playoffs and even then, at the end of the day, all they could say is they played exactly one more game than the Ottawa Red Blacks, Edmonton Elks, and BC Lions. That's it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, it, 2020, 2021 season. We're hoping for we're hoping for a full twenty twenty two. But uh, I mean, do you guys agree with what we say about the team? Let us know. Uh, many places where you can let us know. You know, first you can hit us up on Twitter, uh, either at myself, Repact, R E P P A C T, at Cliff, at Cliffy D, uh, or at our main account over at uh, Alouette's FL Deck, or you can reach out to us uh, and uh, comment on our Facebook page, which is uh, you can look us up for Alouette's Flight Deck or Alouette's Flight Deck Pod. Uh, Instagram, oh, I'm forgetting here. <laughs> Hi, Lily. We've yeah. been. And that's, that's another thing that started with us this year is uh, on, on I Lily. I got to give a shout out to those guys as well because they gave us a new a new avenue, if you will, to yeah. share our thoughts and share our insight with the team mm-hmm. and for everybody. That's right. It, it's absolutely fantastic. It's like Twitter, except with your voice. Instead of typing out, uh, you know, micro micro blogs, you're basically doing a micro podcast, like just 15 seconds. Get your thoughts out. Boom. Out in the out in the Twitter sphere or wherever it may be, yeah. out on social media. And don't and don't even think that it took us fifteen seconds each time. There's no way in hell <laughs> we didn't get it. Um, obviously, all of our past episodes uh, it can be found over at alouettesflightdeck.ca. Uh, you know all the podcast aggregates out there where you can find us. Uh, also, if there's something new this year. If you happen to be following us on Spotify, you can actually now go and rate our podcast like you can do over at Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, but you can now rate us over on Spotify. So, hey, greatly appreciate if you guys could go in there and give us give us the stars you think we deserve. 
Mm-hmm. So that's all that we ask. You know, we give us our honest opinion. Just we expect you to give give you your honest opinion. So yeah. So pretty much any any place where you can download a podcast, folks, just type in the search. So do a search for Alois Flight Deck, and chances are you're going to find us there. And if for whatever reason you can't, well, we've got another great avenue for you to check out the Alois Flight Deck podcast on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And we're almost there, dude. If you if you've been following us for the last couple of weeks, we remember we have the contest out there. If you can get us up to a hundred a uh, hundred subscribers on our YouTube page, uh, then we'll be giving out a new with tags in its original packaging, an, an Alouette's Delta jacket, a brand spanking new one. Brand yes, it's a re- spanking new. Yes, sir. It's a it's a retro style jacket with retro logos, but I assure you, folks, it is a brand spanking new jacket. Yep. Yep, sold, sold as sold by the team a couple of years ago. So they're not available anymore. Um, you know, head over there, just do a search for Alouette's flight deck. You'll find us. We're almost there. We're almost two thirds of the way there to our uh, uh, to our goal. So hey, uh, it'd be greatly appreciated if you could, uh, you know, subscribe, uh, listen, follow, and uh, give you know give give some comments too on that uh, um, below the video. It'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, definitely leave a like, uh, leave a comment too, good or bad. Either one's fine, just as, you know, because again, we, we want constructive cr- criticism as well. If we're doing something wrong, let us know. If we're doing something right, let your friends know. Let your family know. Let your coworkers know. Let everybody know about the Alouette's Flight Tech podcast. Because also, too, and this is something I want to really explore in the 2022 season, we want to take the page further. We want to be able to do a lot of the things that other podcasts are doing as well. We want to incorporate we don't just want to put the podcast on there we want to incorporate video and there's so many great things that we want to be able to do and really expand and grow this podcast Mm -hmm. as much as possible so i mean we need your help to do that folks so by all means head over there subscribe to the podcast channel leave a like give us the feedback give us the love and it'll all come back to you i can promise you that yep for sure so, so much is said. We were lucky enough to to seem like every, you know, we've been lucky when it comes to news that's coming across the wire and stuff like that. And we just happened to be lucky that we decided to wait an extra week, uh, hoping that there would be information. And luck, luckily enough, there is. Um, I guess we can go ahead and it, we can start with, because uh, we mentioned it earlier, that we are, uh, that the Alouettes happened to shed, I guess that's a fair fair word to use uh shed two coaches uh from their from their coaching staff um mm-hmm. where it, ha- it was announced that mickey donovan who was the special teams coordinator and uh, our wide receivers coach uh, robert flash gordon were let go by the team um i found interesting the interesting comments speaking of by the way cliff that when it came to to coach gordon and how it was how it was mentioned, where was it here? Where, where, or sorry, it came from Coach Kahari, where it was like, when with changes come tough decisions, and this was definitely hard when it mm-hmm. came to, to Coach Gordon. Um, I, I guess there seems to be, I, I don't know what it is. It's going to be interesting to see who, who the Alouettes get. Because, you know, Coach Donovan was, a, I think he was a hell of a fine when he came to the team, you know, from a pretty successful uh, head coaching career with the uh, with Concordia University Stingers, um, and obviously the pedigree that uh, Coach Gordon has. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who they get to replace these two uh, coaches on the staff. Yeah, well, let's not forget too. Earlier in the season, uh, Todd Howard, the defensive line coach, was replaced. Despite the fact that the defensive line was actually one of the bright spots for the Alouettes, they felt a change needed to be made, and that's why they brought back Greg Quick as the defensive line coach. So, I mean. Changes on the fly like that are not unusual. Uh, again, as we discussed, uh, special teams this year just was not, it wasn't hitting, as they say. It just wasn't clicking. So, unfortunately, Mickey Donovan has got to pay the price for that. I am very surprised, though, about Robert Gordon because, I mean, look at the season that uh, Gino Lewis and Jake Winnicki had. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> those are, I'll go ahead and I'll say, like, those are, the two of the premier receivers in this, not just on the, the Alouettes, but in the Canadian Football League, you can put those two up against just about any other tandem. And they're right in the discussion as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the depth level, I think, was there. Uh, I definitely think the receivers, for the most part, were doing it. I didn't really see any weak spots when it came to the receiver position. I mean, other than guys going down to injury, which is going to happen. I really didn't see any 
great glaring weaknesses as far as the the receiver core goes. The only thing I could think of is that even though there is a rumor, to, you know, there's a rumor that there's going to be an increase in the coach's salary cap. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it had to do with the, the cap itself and how much uh, Coach Gordon was being paid. Oh, again, that's something only Coach Gordon could answer, and the oh, Alouettes yeah. could answer. Right. But again, I, I do know that as it stands right now, that this is a, a major bone of contention for a lot of teams is the fact that a lot of coaches have no choice but to wear several hats when it comes to you know when it comes to coaching. Like you can't just have just a strict head coach anymore. It seems like head coach also has to be either a defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator, or they got to take care of special teams or you got to, or look, have your or look, what's, look what's happening in Edmonton with the, the hiring, hiring of their new, their new coach slash GM. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if he adds defensive coordinator to his title as well, which begs the question, what do you do with Noel Thorpe? And I, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say it. If Chris Jones decides he wants to be defensive coordinator and ends up uh, kicking Noel Thorpe to the curve. I would not be mad to see hit Noel Thorpe come back to the Alouettes as special teams coach. Because let's not forget, he was the special teams coach back in the early 2000s, and there was no issues there. In fact, he even won a great cup, I believe, uh, with Noel Thorpe as uh, special teams coach. Interesting. Could and- be uh, could be some food for thought. I'm just oh, yeah, putting, no, that, for sure. putting that out there. I know we had uh, John Bowman on the podcast earlier. He, he didn't exactly have glowing praise for for Noel Thorpe as a coach but uh, a lot of players who did play for the Alouettes in the defense have a lot you know had nothing but love for him so I, I couldn't I can't help but wonder if uh, maybe this is some way to bring and don't forget too Noel Thorpe was a coach with the Montreal Caribbean who were coached by Danny Machocha anything's possible dude I, I mean listen Sometimes these things just kind of work out. I mean, we, we, we know that Danny likes to sign him some carabangs, uh, whether they're coaches or whether they're uh, players. So we'll see what happens. I never even thought about that one. But still, hey, that's all the fun about the offseason of the CFL, I'll tell you. Eh? <laughs> well, that's it. Like It's all speculation, right? Like, I'm just, you know, throwing stuff out there, see if it sticks. You know, just you know, mm-hmm. floating ideas out there. Sure. That's, that's it. So Sure. Why not? Um, besides the two coaches, I mean, uh, we actually had some players. We we talk about some the, the uh, who, some players that were free that were potential free agents before we saw the actual list itself that came out uh, this the, within the last week. Uh, Eugene Lewis uh, was re-upped for another year. See that that surprised me. I'm gonna ask you a question about that. He he, he was re-signed for just a one-year contract. Uh, Najee Murray, defensive back Najee Murray, was signed for two years, as was. Um, David Brown. Thank you. I couldn't read my own writing. That's how bad it is right now. Uh, O-Lyman, David Brown was also signed for another two years. Uh, thoughts on them only signing Gino for a year? You know, it's it's interesting because t- towards the end of the season, uh, Gino wasn't quite getting the respect that I think he felt he deserved, and rightly so, because he had a phenomenal season, all things considered. He was able to play, no matter who the quarterback was, he was still able to make those plays happen. He was still very he, much in the discussion as far as being one of the league leaders in receiving. And even hurt as he played. We know he played hurt in, in the in the East Signing Final. We know he was hurt. <laughs> Big time. I mean, th- th- there's no question. He was walking wounded. But despite all that, he still managed to have himself a phenomenal season. And you talk about betting on yourself. Like he, I, I think that's what he likes to do is he likes to bet on himself. Like he, he knows what he brings to the table. And I think the Alouettes deep down know what, what he brings to the table as well. So letting him go to free agency would have been an absolute disaster. Like, how do you explain that to the fans? Mm-hmm. That you, you have one of the, a guy who is essentially leading the league in receiving at, at many points during the season, and you let him walk? That, that wouldn't have flown, for sure. And to me, I, I think it was absolutely great that they were able to get him for another year. This year by year stuff is a little concerning, if only because you, I guess it's, yeah, the team wants to invest in Gino. Gino believes in this team. He believes in the system. He definitely believes in VA as his quarterback. And I've, I'm pr- pretty sure that was one of the reasons, too, because it was also mentioned as well in that same press release that VA was, his deal was reworked and he was also extended. So obviously, VA and Gino go hand in hand. Why wouldn't he want to sign for longer? Why wouldn't the team push for longer? Again, this is something that only the the Alouettes and Gino Lewis know for sure. Mm-hmm. I think you would have liked to have had that reassurance of knowing that he'd be here for at least another two years, if not three. I mean, quite frankly, I say keep him as long as we can. 
like this year to year stuff. I get why certain players do that. Maybe it's as I said, it's 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 an assurance that if for whatever reason things don't go my way and I know what I'm worth, I can go get it elsewhere. It's a you know a bit of a leverage tool. I and I can appreciate Gino if that's how Gino's thinking. That's you know I can appreciate that that that, that line of thought. Uh, maybe the team too. I maybe they just want to be cautious as far as not being saddled with a huge contract. Even though in theory you can cut a player anytime you want. That's that shouldn't even be an issue. But yeah. I, I really wish I had a better answer for it. At the end of the day, though, I'm thrilled that Gino is going to be back in 2022. For sure. And I'm thrilled to know that it's going to be Vernon Adams that's going to be throwing him those touchdown passes, as far as we can tell. So I think when it, when it's all said and done, you just got to be grateful for the fact that you still have a Gino Lewis in your lineup and knowing that, at least for 2022, you know, if, he, if, if it all comes together again, if he still has another phenomenal season like he did in 2021, somehow, some way, find a way to make sure that he does not go elsewhere. Make sure he does essentially retire as an Alouette. Yeah. Although he's still too young to think about retirement, let's let's not kid ourselves. Folks. Oh, for and, sure. I, it would be interesting to see if we could, you know, even if talking to Gino off off the record on the the process behind this one year contract and why it wasn't more. Mm-hmm. So for another time, I guess another time. Now the next move, which was announced also with Gino Lewis, kind of cemented what you and I were expecting. Uh, Vernon Adams was uh, was extended through twenty twenty three. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you and I both knew that this the hammer was coming. And I can't. I'd have to go back and check the 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 archives to see when I said that this would occur if it did occur. Um, I think I did. I, I may have said it would happen right after Grey Cup if they were going to drop the hammer on him. I'd have to go back and check. I'd have to go back and check. Anybody who knows what I said, uh, DM me please, and I'll because I, I think I'm right on this one. Well, uh, if I recall correctly, I. Uh, you seem to think that he'd be sticking around. A lot of it would depend on the health of Vernon Adams and right. how his rehab was going. Right. But so uh, I, I, if, I think there was a. Well, I, I think the, the 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 extending of Vernon cemented. It, it gave us our answer. I, I think it did too, and then it just so. became a matter of when, not if. Exactly. Exactly. So yes, we're leading up to Trevor Harris was released from the Alouettes. Uh, actually, along with uh, O Lyman David Foucault. Um, but yeah, Owls will not be on the hook for that monster bonus come February. Nope. And if another team truly thinks that Trevor Harris can be the man, if they think they can be that quarterback that everybody was pimping him out to be when the Alouettes made the, the deal to acquire him from the Edmonton Elks, well, have at it. He, he's, a, he's a free agent now. You can sign him for as much money as you want, as much money as you think he deserves. It's it's all you folks. It's all any other CFL team that wants to have them, they can have them now. You you have absolutely everyone's permission to go and try to acquire his services. Yeah, and by the way, I, I don't I don't see him being you know unemployed for very long. Well, neither do I. But I think if he's thinking he's going to be signing another deal where he'll be getting like you know starters money. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he better get that thought out of his head. I think he now he has to take a look at himself. The body of work that he put together in 2021, not just in Montreal, but in Edmonton as well. Whether or not it's his fault, you know, the circumstances of what took place in Edmonton, be that as it may, the numbers clearly, and again, numbers don't lie, numbers clearly show that he's not worth starting quarterback money. If he's willing to accept a backup role and backup money, I definitely think there's a place for him in, on a Canadian Football League team. Mm-hmm. I still think he, if maybe called, and maybe that's really what it came down to, is as a as a backup, he did a great job. He was a great backup for the Ottawa Red Blacks for Henry Burris. Was a great backup for Ricky Ray in Toronto. But un- unfortunately, time has shown that when you give him the starting role, it doesn't quite work. It just it for any number of reasons and. Let's face it, he's not a young man anymore either. Like He's in his mid-30s, which is unfortunately when quarterbacks, with the exception of Tom Brady, start to decline. He may now have to take a good long look at himself and decide, okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I, my role right now is to be a backup, possibly a mentor to a burgeoning young quarterback in this league. You know, does he have, does, does he have something to offer somebody? I believe so. I truly do. 
It's just I don't think he's he warrants starting quarterback money. I don't think any team, no matter how badly they need a quarterback, is going to look at him and blow their brains out to acquire his services. Yeah, I think he'll. I think he will be on a training camp roster come next next May. I don't know which one. I guess time will tell that. But yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think there is a place for Trevor Harris still in the Canadian Football League. It's just not as a starting quarterback. Yeah, and I think this this past year, whether it was with the Elks or with the Alouettes has shown that, no, he, he cannot be that guy. He can't be the guy that people thought he could be. He can't even be the insurance policy. Like, you can't say, okay, well, we're in a, we're in a jam. We need a quarterback. Call Trevor Harris. He'll, he'll save us. He, he can't do it. He just can't do it. This year has proven that he cannot be that guy. Simple as that. He can be a good backup. I think he can be a good option. He can maybe even steal you a game or two if, you know, in a less pressure-filled situation. But when it comes to being a starting quarterback in the Canadian Football League, I just don't think he can be that anymore. Simple as that. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see during what's happening during the offseason. Uh, thoughts on David Fugo? Well. Uh, because I, I, remember, I remember your comments from last last uh, last episode. So <laughs> if you're, you're probably just going to rehash them again, but still. Well, I mean, listen. I wanted David Foucault to work in Montreal. I really did. I thought the change of scenery would have done him some good. And in a limited role, he actually was a very solid piece of the puzzle. But as injuries happen, which they tend to do, and towards that that later part of the season, going into the playoff game, he was given more and more responsibility, and he it he did not look good. He just he was beaten, like beaten badly. He got the brake speed off of him. Mm-hmm. And as a result, Quarterbacks were able, or uh, defenders were able to get to the quarterback, Trevor Harris, and you couple the inability to stop the rush with Trevor Harris's inability to get rid of the ball quickly, and you see sacks, you see fumbles, you see that pressure, and it was not a good look at all for Foucault. And it's unfortunate because, yeah, he's a he's a Montreal guy. He's a you know he was a, a former Caribbean, so Danny Machocha knows him well. It probably expected him to be that guy for the Alouettes and it just didn't materialize. It's unfortunate, but you know, like unfortunately, you know, you are what your record says you are. And unfortunately David Foucault's record right now for the Alouettes just didn't look good. So his performance in the Eastern semifinal pretty much sealed his fate, unfortunately. And I I think it really did come down to, it's not a matter of if, but when he was going to be released and lo and behold, I'm actually really surprised they released him the same day as Harris, but <laughs> like I'm not. It almost looks like everybody's blaming, going to blame those two for why the Alouettes lost. And yeah, I, I think they got to share their. They're not the sole reason why the Alouettes lost the Eastern semifinal, but their play on that day didn't do them any favors. That's for sure. So yeah, that's just that's just football, folks. I mean, will Foucault res- resurface elsewhere? Maybe, but again, I, I think uh, unfortunately. Time has shown that, uh, you know, he's not the guy that was was able to go to the Super Bowl for the Carolina Panthers. Uh, he's not the guy that played, his, you know, lights out football for the Montreal Caribbean. Unfortunately, he just, you know, it was good in small spurts. He definitely is someone you can have for depth, but putting him in the starters role just, just didn't materialize. It just didn't happen, which is unfortunate. But once again, that's just, that's how the cookie crumbles. Yeah. Um. Owls did have some CFL All-Stars this year. William Stanbeck, Eugene Lewis, and Jake Wenicke. Congrats to the three. Uh, no surprise there. Like, absolutely no surprise uh, for those three. I mean, again, uh, we, we could spend hours, and we have spent hours, actually, yeah. talking about how amazing those three gentlemen are. And this is just the proof. Like, this is undeniable proof of just how good a season William Stanbeck, Gino Lewis, and Jake Winnicki had, and they were phenomenal. They were leaders in their respective categories at many points throughout the season. I mean, again, William Sandbeck, he took the rushing title home and it wasn't even close. I mean, like, like I said, the fact that he didn't win most outstanding player for the Canadian football league, it really does blow my mind. I mean, yes, I'm not taking anything away from what Zach Caleros did for the blue bombers, but when you talk about a most outstanding player for a guy to have only played, like he didn't even play all 14 games and you did Caleros, but I mean, you take a look at the body of work and how do you not make William Stanback the most outstanding player? I mean, yes, Zach Caleros did a, a phenomenal job in, in Winnipeg. Proof of it is they're back-to-back Great Cup champions. I will not take that away from Zach Caleros. But you take a look at what William Stanback did, and he didn't even play a full season. 
due yeah. to injury. Yeah. And he still put up some phenomenal numbers. Uh, and apparently it wasn't even close. Apparently uh, like, uh, it, was, it wasn't unanimous that uh, uh, Caleros won the most outstanding player for the league, but he apparently had the lion's share of the votes. And I'm sitting there going, are you, are you kidding me? Like, Are you just that dazzled by the outstanding record that the Blue Bombers had? I mean, yes, he he did not make very many mistakes with that Caleros throughout the season. But again, like he, you almost expect him to be at that level now. Whereas William Stanback, for what he was able to do, despite missing time due to injury, is still able to rack up this absolutely incredible number of, of yards on the ground. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm dumbfounded, quite frankly, as to why he wasn't. Mo- but you know what? He's just going to use this as motivation. And the fact that the, the league made him an all-star, okay, that's nice. That's cool. I mean, that's a, a nice little feather in the cap. But I know for Stanback, that's not going to be enough. And I... I, I expect him coming in with a chip on his shoulder and just ready to work. And that's just going to be even better for a guy like uh, Vernon Adams, who he knows what he has with this, with his stud. And you, you know, VA is going to make the most of uh, William Stanback in the backfield. There's no question about that in 2022. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, we, I know we mentioned they were off. We mentioned it to the last show with the potential free agents. the, I think they were when they if were officially announced by the league. Now, I mean, any surprises? I think there were there weren't any surprises. Where I think we really went over all the ones that we thought there were going to be free agents, less the ones that have already been uh, uh, re-signed by the Alouettes. Yeah, I mean, we 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 did discuss it, and again, we'll we'll see what happens. The fact that Gino has been re-signed is a huge relief, as far as I'm concerned. I think it, it's a move that had to be made. I mean. Ideally, you would have liked to have gotten him for two, three years as opposed to just one. But again, that could have been a move that may end up essentially benefiting both teams when it's all said and done. We'll see. But just the fact that we have Gino Lewis back for 2022 is, as far as I'm concerned, a major coup. Now you got to get everything else in place. There's a lot. Like I said, we've discussed who we think belongs in. Like, this, this could be some tough choices that are going to have to be it's made. It's going to be, dude. I mean, that's that's just the nature of the business as too, especially when you see now that we know who else is a, a pending free agent. I mean, you, you take a look at that shopping list and you're like, oh, I bet he would be good for the Alouettes. Oh, he would be good for the Alouettes, too. And then you're like, OK, yeah, you sign those if you're able to sign those guys. That's all well and good. But then it's like, OK, now who do you let go? Who do you say thanks but no thanks to? And that's the tough part like that. Oh, gosh, like that's because, again, you don't want to make any stupid moves like you don't want to let someone go. They sign with another team and they play lights out football. And you're like, dang, why didn't we keep them? Yeah. And that, ha- that happens more often than not too, but this is football. I mean, that's what, what blows my mind more than anything else is just the number of potential free agents out of Saskatchewan and Winnipeg too. I think of the, they've only got four starters from that great cup game that are under contract for 2022. Everybody else is a free agent. Yeah. Like that, that, that's incredible. Like, yeah. Was, and again, you're not going to be able to keep everybody. That's the thing. Like, you know, it's great that they went back to back. And I, I can appreciate that they, they got that, you know, that camaraderie, that, that feeling. And maybe, you know, you, you want to get the band back together again for another run. But how many of those players had phenomenal years? And they've got to be thinking to themselves, OK, I got my rings. You know, I, I've established myself. Now it's time to get paid. And. At what point do you say, okay, well, what's more important, championships or money? I mean, winning a, a third Grey Cup ring would be cool, but does it pay the bills? You know? Yeah. Like this, 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 there's a lot to consider here. And Saskatchewan, holy cow. I mean, <laughs> fit, there's, I think there's like 50 pending free agents. I, I mean, like, who, who do they have under contract besides Cody Fajardo? Uh, the water boy? <laughs> Again, it'll be an interesting offseason. I mean, unless Jason Moss, uh, who's the offensive coordinator, unless he's going to, you know, be the backup quarterback now for uh, for Fajardo. I mean, <laughs> who who who's still under contract for the? For, I think for the it'll writers? be it'll be very interesting once we because Edmonton now has their whole situation figured out with head coach, so that'll be an interesting twist, especially with a lot of the free agents who like to play for for Coach Jones. But That's then who, who whoever they bring in in Ottawa, Ottawa's going to be very interesting as well because. That was a team for the past couple of seasons that's just been in disarray, and now they've got the they've secured the services of Sean Burke, who helped build the Hamilton Tiger Cats to a perennial a perennial contender. 
you know a couple of he'll be wanting to bring in over a couple of his guys from from the Tiger Cats as well. And again, if he's given carte blanche to do what he needs to do to make this team better, uh-huh. I mean, who knows? I mean, yeah. it, it, and, hey, having Lapo as your head coach can't help either. I mean, can can help too. So I mean, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens. I I'm gonna float out a, a crazy theory. I just what are those? This is like you know. Lighting a, this is like lighting a stick of dynamite and throwing it out there. Okay. Zach Caleros is a free agent. What if uh, <laughs> the guy who helped draft him, or, or, help, or not, he didn't draft him, but helped bring him to Hamilton the first time, is now the general manager of the Red Blacks. The head coach of the Red Blacks helped design the offense that Zach Caleros was able to succeed in. Could Zach Caleros become a member of the Red Blacks? Huh. Interesting. I, I mean, they've got nothing to lose either. I mean... Look at their quarterback situation. I mean, it didn't work with Matt Nichols. Uh, definitely didn't work with Dominique Davis. Uh, you know, like, yeah, they got the, the, the youngster, Caleb Evans, but, uh, and they got Duck Hodges. Uh, and, you know, I don't think that's going to work out really. When you think we'll see it. what, it, again, offseason is going to be fun. It is. I mean, uh, but can you imagine, Tim? Imagine. Because you would have thought, you would have thought Saskatchewan, uh, sorry, you, you would have thought that, you know, that, Calaris would have been would have been extended already. You would have thought. One would think. I mean, the guy just brought you two great cups. How how do you not like? How do you not have this guy signed, sealed, and delivered already? I, I mean, <laughs> see what happens. But again, this this is one of those situations. Like, okay, I I, I think for him, the the past two years was about proving himself because he had a bit of a tumultuous period where people didn't even think he was going to be playing anymore, and then he goes and wins not one but two great cups. So he's proven himself. He's in that discussion as far as outstanding quarterbacks in the Canadian Football League. Mm-hmm. But now, okay, I've got my rings. I've proven myself. Maybe now I want to get paid. Or maybe I want to prove that wasn't a fluke. And I go to a team like Ottawa. And hey, I know the coach. I know the GM. They know me. I mean, it sounds crazy, but maybe it's not so crazy when you sit and think about it. Yeah, I know. I mean, free agency. Holy cow. I mean... It's like, fun. They're, they're, it's fun, but it's still something that needs to be corrected in the CFL. Yeah, yeah. But I tell you, this this winter is going to prove to be very, very interesting. And I think too, if I'm not mistaken, the collective bargaining agreement is going to have to be revised as well because it's yeah, taken that, a hit. That's the thing too. I know. It, it this off season is going to be nuts. It really will. I like. There's really not going to be much of an off season in the Canadian Football League, folks. Between free agency, the draft. Uh, Everything that's going on, I mean, it's like, yeah, we're going to take a little bit of time to collect our thoughts and and kind of decompress from this season that was. But I mean, before you know it, folks, we'll be back in the, we'll be back in the saddle and we'll be we're going to have to go through a lot of all this stuff, not just for the Alouettes, but I mean, league wide, just to see just what kind of chaos could possibly ensue. Agreed. And you can't have chaos in 2022 without having a schedule for 2022 and. I think it's something that we expected to come after the Grey Cup was done, mm-hmm. after, you know, Winnipeg did what they needed to do. By the way, congrats on the, uh, I guess we can call them back-to-back champs. Absolutely. Uh, but we now have a seat. We now have a 2022 schedule and back to 18 games. Uh, preseason starts in May. <laughs> yep. It, it shall be interesting. It really will, and we'll At, go into a little bit, little bit of more depth here. But just some quick, some quick notes on on the schedule itself. And as it stands right now, folks, it is a full schedule. Yes, a full right. eighteen game schedule. Mm-hmm. Not fourteen, but eighteen games, as it should be. Yep. So, props to the league for being able to put that together. And here's hoping that it, you know, we, here's hoping we get those eighteen games in. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the opener is currently scheduled for June 23rd versus Saskatchewan. Very interesting, considering that this is the day before St. Jean. I'm very surprised, actually, that I guess it's technically a Friday. It'd be a Friday game, even though it's a Thursday, which I, you and I both hate. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, yeah. Thanksgiving Day is back, baby, and this is this seems to be the the the, the tradition uh, versus the Ottawa Red Blacks. That's October 10th. Uh, the finale is October 22nd versus the Toronto Argonauts. Quick synopsis, three Thursday games. Most of them are front-loaded, thank God. Uh, three Friday games, two Saturday and a Monday. Uh, I think, and we, I think we have some 
game, some home games. I have to go back and I don't have the full thing here in front of me. But I think there are some, I think three in a row, three in a row, three straight games at home in a row with a bye week in between, if I remember correctly. I think that's what it was mm-hmm. in, in the latter half of the season, which I, I don't mind. Um, for the second year in a row, the Alouettes do not play at BC and at home versus Calgary. So the Al- the Seville is going to go with their, what I called, you know, they're, uh, they're trying to reduce ske- the reduce travel. Again, I mm-hmm. guess they're budget saving. But my, I would say, and I told you this before when it was released, that I think what the league needs to do is that they need, if they're going to continue with this, where we don't play a home and home series versus the everybody in the West that they need to alternate it because there's, there's no reason. There's no reason for us not to be playing at BC and at home versus Calgary again for the second straight season. Mm-hmm. No, so, for sure. So it's... rotate, rotate. You still could have done it, but you could have rotated it. Yeah. And again, I understand why you want to have more divisional matches because again, those are crucial. That's, mm-hmm. that's what helps make, make or break the playoff run. Yep. And, uh, uh, same as last or this past season towards the end it's pretty much i think the last four or five games are pretty much all divisional so it's uh you know like it's one of those things where every game is going to count or at least it should count uh to me that's uh you know this is where that those competitive fires this is where those rivalries come into play i mean i, I can tell that the, uh, the league is definitely trying to push montreal ottawa into a rivalry because again you're playing them the preseason game as well as three if I'm not mistaken, four, or, which is like or four. last year, like last year, we're technically we're playing Ottawa five times this, in 2022, but it's for AOB. You know, again, this is reverting back. I, you know, I mentioned it earlier in the season. This is this is stuff that this was the norm back in the 70s mm-hmm. and the 80s. This, this was the norm where you played teams four times, even though you had some, even though you had crossovers still with the mm-hmm. with the other division. So yeah. th- to me, this is the norm, and people need to quit bitching. That like, oh no, we're playing Ottawa four times, or oh no, we're playing you know Montreal four times. So what? It's happening across the league. I think every team's doing this once, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So you know, it, it it is. You know what? I don't mind. It, it, it's a regional thing. I understand BC. You know what? BC. I I don't kind of don't mind considering how crappy we played BC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I keep, I still want to go out, get up and get my, get myself out to BC Place to see an Alouettes game there, but and I guess I won't be having until twenty twenty three at the earliest. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. we'll we, see. We have a there is a three game a three game road trip so to speak with a uh, in September with a bye week thrown in in between. Uh, the Owls play uh, three of their last five games at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, do finish their last game of the regular season is at home versus Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, 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 sorry. Correction. Uh, they finished the 29th of October at Toronto. At Toronto. Right. Um, but, hey, you know what? Saturday games, I don't mind. Four o'clock. As I say, we get Thursday games over with. Uh, we, got, we have a... a yeah. We have two home and home series uh, yep. with uh, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg. Yep. Winnipeg is, a, is the natural back-to-back and... Uh, sorry. Yeah, Winnipeg is the natural back to back, but the Saskatchewan has a bye week thrown in between that home that home and home series. Right. So, which is fine. Which is fine. But uh, but overall, I mean, you, you look at the games itself. Mind you, we do have one Thursday game in July. Ugh. No, we don't. <laughs> sorry, our, our home games are white in white here. We do in we August. Do. I hate, God. I hate Thursday games. I. <laughs> I hate Thursday games. I'm glad that I'm glad there are two Saturday games, though. That may be seen to be a new thing with the CFL, so I don't mind the two Saturday games. But uh, again, we we talked about this with Mario Ciccini, the president of the Mm Alouettes, and he told me that there are people that want Thursday games. I want to know who. Yeah, because I'm not crazy about them. You're not crazy about them. I I hate them. Pretty much everybody we've spoken to are not crazy. So who are these mystery fans that want Thursday games? Show yourselves. Yeah. But now, mind you, we don't know what the U Sports schedule is supposed to be like for for uh, for the McGill Redbirds. Spoiler alert: they start in September. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get it. <laughs> I hate Thursday games. I know they're mandated too, but this is the most Thursday games we've had. I think in a, a while, four seasons, five seasons, maybe, maybe three. I, I, I you didn't have. 
I yeah. Hate, I hate Thursday. God, I hate Thursday. <sighs> yeah, to me, like... Alice have had the most Thursday games since they were returned in twenty in 1996. I mean, you, you can't tailgate on Thursday night unless you're going to take the next day off, which not everybody is. People that you want people to come from out of town. You want to make Quebec. You want to make the Alouettes Quebec's football team. Well, guess what? People out in Quebec City or Chicoutimi or Gatineau, they're not going to make the trek down to Montreal on a Thursday. Stay over necessarily stay overnight and and basically screw up their work week just to go what? see an Alouettes game. You're not going to come all the way down from Riviera to Lou? Come on! <laughs> what type of well, fan are you? <laughs> uh, I was going to say. Looking at you, Sherbrooke. Looking at you, uh, Three Rivers. A B to B to Mescamang. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Show yourselves, Thursday fans. Come on, come on, let's shoot. Come on. That's right. That's right. Valdor, you want some of this action? Come on down. Grenville, come on. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah, that's right. Saint Louis de Haha. There you go. Oh, I love that name. I love <laughs> that name. That is a real, that is a real name, folks. There's actually a city in Quebec called Saint Louis de Haha. I love it. I love I, it. I, I kid you not. <laughs> no, I love that. Oh, big time! It's it's awesome. Yeah, that's where that's where the other should have their scrimmage game. <laughs> oh, jeez. Hey, how else are you going to promote the CFL in these little towns? Well, okay, let's put it this way. You know, going back in the history, the Alouettes have had some preseason games. I think they had one in Three Rivers once, and this this was back in the seventies where they had a pre where they had a uh, a red versus white game. Oh, huh? there you go. And they have, a, they have a, I don't think, I think they only have a baseball stadium though there. Mm, that would be a little tricky then. But still. But hey, that's it. it. Why not? If it's all about trying to grow the game, trying to help, uh, you know, promote this team as Quebec's football team, then these are some of the wacky out of the, you know, you know, thinking outside of the box kind of moves that you're going to have to do. I mean, that's what, what could it hurt at this point? Yeah. Four Thursday games in 2017. How do the Elwoods do that year? In the Thursday games? Well, in 2017. Oh, well, crap. <laughs> yeah. Not great, Bob. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they went not, they went not, one and three. There you go. <laughs> including uh, including a whiteout game, which we you and I both hate. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, I hate Thursday games. Uh, but in all in all, I'm very happy that we have a schedule out. The, the fingers crossed, considering what's happening right now with Omicron, that... Um, Everything will still be okay, and we'll get training camp like normal, and we will be in our normal seats like we normally are, Cliff. For um, actually, it'll be it'll be before practice now since training camp is starting earlier. Usually, mm-hmm. you know, for uh, Victoria Day, we're sitting there at camp, but and God willing, we'll be sitting there at camp as well in 2022. Yeah, so. I mean. Listen, this is going to be, uh, I mean, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I mean, it's still kind of crazy, but, you know, we, we've managed to make it this far and, you know, we, we, we just got to think positive. We got to, you know, like having this schedule does give hope that, okay, if nothing else, the league is doing everything possible to make sure that a full season is a go and that, you know, we're going to try and get things back the way they used to be, you know, pre-COVID and if they can do that, if they can still manage to to make that happen, despite everything that is going on, despite what feels like a never ending dumpster fire for this entire planet, if we at least get this back, I mean, that's I, I think for uh, for a lot of fans, that's going to come, that's going to start feeling more like normal as it should be, and that's all we really want. I think is just that sense of normalcy again. I mean, I want to be able to go to training camp. I want to be able to say hello to the players in person, even if I have to wear a mask to do it, then so yeah. be it. But, you know, little things like that, like just masks, us- masks to me will be still be the norm people. And even with it, it's again, some cultures have worn masks. They've, they've known what to do and they, they still do. And we see it in Montreal that we saw this in Montreal before. Yeah. And so. if you have to be quadruple vax to go see a game in 2022, then so be it. You know, like that's, that's all it is. It's just, we got to do what we got to do. That's that's really what it comes down to. And if the league's willing to still put on an entertaining product despite all of this, and I got a feeling you take a look at everything that's going on with free agency, having a full schedule, trying to get back to the way things used to be with all the change that's hap- that happened so far and is going to be happening. It's going to be exciting, folks. I, I really do think 2022 is going to be an exciting football season, if nothing else. So I, 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 I. We just got to get through things like like we always do. That that's really what it comes down to more yeah. than anything else. So you know whatever whatever it takes to make it happen, 
let's do it. But, you know, we, we had a lot of fun this year, all things considered. It wasn't perfect, especially for the Alouettes. But you know what? I had a blast. I was glad to be able to go back to Percival Molson Stadium, sit in my seats, see the games, win or lose. And God damn, we had a lot of fun too, Tim, didn't we? I, yeah, we did. We did. You know, it, it was challenging. We it was getting back to seeing people again and, and being in crowds. It wasn't easy. Um, I appreciate, and I know I harped on this, but I did appreciate what you and Chris did. Yeah, I, I think you did it because you wanted to do it when it came to wearing masks full time. And, you know, if you hadn't, that would have been fine. But I think we were all on the same page. You know, it just it, a lot of people at Percival Molson. I, I still anyway, it's I had question. I still question the rules that were put forth mm-hmm. in his in stadium. I really do when it came to masks um, about when you could take them off. But again, I applaud everybody for doing what they did. I, I, well, I you know, so. Yeah, and I think with, with the schedule back to kind of normal in the sense of being able to have games when they're supposed to be, hopefully that'll mean less, you know, games of 11,000 people because of it being too cold to go to a football game. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that, that looking at the dates, I I mean, dude, I, I was wrong. We have four straight home games in six weeks. That's wow. four home dates with two bye weeks thrown in there. In all, in in late August to late September, all fri- uh, Saturday and three fr- and three Friday games. There you go. So I mean, like that's prime I football think weather. Ever, I had to. I got to go back and check history. I don't think it's ever happened for the Owls. So there you go. It, it won't be minus uh, you know twenty. It won't be anything super cold. I mean, it's ideal football weather. I think for for Montrealers. So yeah, I miss. That's it again. I I missed. I missed. You know, I, I love you, Alouette fans. I love you, the listeners. Uh, yeah, I love my seatmates. You know, I it, just being what they what they were. I appreciate everybody for everything that they did this season, not only in in stadium but on the podcast. Yeah, everybody that joined us. It was a hell of a season. It's we didn't get where we wanted to, you know, in the end, but we were able to get back to some semblance of normality, even though we're what's happening now. But we've nothing but the you know the future to look forward to and. You know, hopefully getting back to nor- more than just normal of what 2021 was. Mm-hmm. So Without question. Without question. And I, I think it's definitely feasible. And if we can get another exciting season in, and the fact that we got this 2021 season in is tremendous. I, I said that before and I'll say it again. It's, hey, 30 episodes, dude. That that seems to be our, our, our number. If we get in 30 episodes a season, hey, I'm all, I'm all for it. Yeah, and the fact that everybody else is coming along for the ride with us, amazing. The the fact that you folks are going out there and buying our merchandise with our logo on it blows my mind, and we can't thank you enough for it. The fact that people want to follow us on all these social media platforms is amazing. The fact that we have so many different ways to get the word out on this team and people are on board is amazing. So, yeah, this – it, it doesn't happen without people listening. Otherwise, it's just Tim and I talking to each other. Yeah. I don't know how interesting that it may be if it was just the two of us listening. But <laughs> the fact that so many other people are participating, interacting with us, it's it's tremendous. And we, we cannot thank you enough for what I think was overall a pretty outstanding season for the Alouette's Flight Tech podcast. And again, I can't overstate just how excited I am at the possibility of what can become for 2022. I mean, I'm... You know, like I definitely think we need to take a little time to relax to kind of go through the season that was. And like I said, we do have a lot of ideas that we want to see come to fruition, and we're going to do everything we can to make it happen. Yeah, and it's all to benefit you, the listeners, because we want to give you the best experience possible with this podcast. You know, we want to we want to take things to the next level, and I know we can. I I know Tim and I we are committed to this. We we want to make this happen. We want to really spread our wings, so to speak, and really make this podcast something for everybody, not just for Alouettes fans, but for all CFL fans, for all football fans, really, across the globe. Because, again, let's not forget, we've got a listener in Russia. And shout out to that listener, because (laughs) we do this for you too, my man. (laughs) That's Badania. I don't Russian, but (laughs) God damn it, we want to make sure our Russian listener is respected and appreciated as well. So regardless of where you listen to the Alouettes Flight Deck folks, We appreciate each and every one of you. We really hope you come on board with us for 2022 and beyond because we want to make this happen. And without you, it won't be as easy. So 
by all means, keep interacting with us. Keep, you know, checking in with us. We'll keep checking in with you. And let's just, let's make 2022 an awesome season, not just on the field with the Alouettes, but here on the podcast universe as well. Yep, exactly. Stay tuned and stay tuned to all of our socials for more information on what's coming up for 2022. Uh, you can, hey, you can still reach out to us though. As I said, we're, we're all, you know, we're, all of us are on Twitter, so you can still reach out to us. Uh, head over to the new improved Facebook page, um, you know, and stay tuned for, for more information on on the new shows coming up for during the off season and for the launch of season seven of the Montreal Alouettes Flight Deck. Cliffy D, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have done it with anybody else, bud. I really appreciate you, and I'm looking forward to season seven. Oh yeah, Tim, I'm telling you right now. Like I said, we've got big plans for this podcast. We we want to make things happen. I know you and I, we're going to make it happen, and I'm I'm excited. I'm really excited. I think we had a great year this year. Uh, thank you again to all the guests that came onto the show, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm just looking I'm looking ahead, and I'm excited. I just can't help but be excited at what's come. I'm glad you're on board with me on this. I'm glad we're doing this together. God, is it? Is it June yet? No. Is it February? Yet? Is it February Cause, yet? Cause <laughs> that's more than likely. That's when we'll be back. We'll we'll be you know yeah. And, unless again something massive happens in January. But that, uh, stay tuned, folks. Stay tuned. That's all I can say is stay tuned. Stay subscribed. And again, get on that YouTube, folks, because yeah, like you I, want said, a free I would jacket? I would I would love nothing more than to have as part of the season seven debut to be able to give away that jacket. Exactly. By that point, I want us to have well over a hundred subscribers on YouTube. Let's get this jacket given out. Someone deserves this jacket. I want to re- reward somebody with it. So get going folks, subscribe, like everything, whatever you want to do, stay connect with us again. This is your podcast too, folks. So interact, engage everything. I'm you're, just throwing up buzzwords at this point. Yeah, I was so. about to say you're you're running you're running out of adjectives. Get, get open the thesaurus. Hey, <laughs> we appreciate you, everybody. We appreciate you again uh, for for joining us for the 2021 season. So for the final time for the, for season seven for everybody here <laughs> at the Alouettes Flight Deck Podcast for Cliffy D. I'm Tim Capper. Ron. Final approach. Stay safe.